Good evening, and welcome to Full Moon Matinee. I'm your host, The Detective, bringing you the finest crime dramas and film noir from the golden age of Hollywood. Tonight's picture is from 1948. Call Northside 777, starring Jimmy Stewart, Richard Conti, and Lee J. Cobb. In this picture is the first Hollywood feature film to be shot on location entirely in Chicago. It's about a Chicago Times reporter who looks into an 11 year old murder case of a cop who was killed in 1932 during Prohibition. And he honestly believes the man who was convicted of it to be truly guilty at first. But as he gathers more evidence and changes his mind, he's stonewalled by authorities who would rather not admit that they were wrong. Now this picture is in fact based on a true story. Uh, the real life reporter, and, and his name was James McGuire, who by the way was hired as a technical advisor for the picture tonight. Uh, but James McGuire, he looked into an 11 year old murder case of a cop killed in 1932. And as he gathered evidence, uh, basically the, the man who was wrongly convicted of it, and, and that man's real name was Joseph Mychek, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, was eventually able to get him freed in 1944. And that was due to the efforts of the reporter. Now, in tonight's picture, some of the names were changed because many of these people were still alive at the time of the picture, and not all of them gave their consent to having their real names used in the film. So yes, yeah, some of the names were changed. Now, as far as the actresses tonight, uh, the women, uh, the actresses that you'll see in tonight's picture tend to be in very small bit roles, none of them in a way that you would call a femme fatale, okay? So it's a little unique for a noir on that aspect. But there are two actresses, uh, Joanne de Berg, she's playing the convict's wife, and also Cassia Orzazuski, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, she's playing the convict's mother. Both of them are making their screen debuts in tonight's picture. So, from 1948, call Northside 777. Let's roll the picture. In the year 1871, the Great Fire nearly destroyed Chicago. But out of the ashes of that catastrophe rose a new Chicago, a city of brick and brawn, concrete and guts, with a short history of violence beating in its pulse. That history is on record, and the record is kept by the newspaper men who have made Chicago's papers great. No period in Chicago's history was more violent than the years of Prohibition. 
the rise and fall of the bootlegging empires was written in blood and bullets. In 1932, there were 365 murders committed in Chicago, one for each day of the year. Eight policemen were shot down in the line of duty. One of the most ruthless of these murders occurred on December 9th, 1932, on South Ashland Avenue, in a place operated by a woman named Wanda Skutnik. Wanda Skutnik's store in the Polish district was the front for a speakeasy. You got change for 20? That's all right. Pay me next time. Wanda, you're looking at a guy that's coming down with a cold. Sit down. Oh, thanks. Hi. Hi. For a cold, this is good. Thanks, Wanda. Police, Wanda. Get the police, quick. Hello. Hello, Central. Get me the police. Yeah, quick, please. This cornered, frightened bootlegger gave information that pointed suspicion towards a man named Tomek Zaleska. Tomek Zaleska couldn't be found. But two weeks later, a tip from another source Reveal that Zaleska had spent the night of the murder with his friend, Frank Wiecek. The police closed in on the home of Helen and Frank Wiecek. Helen and Frank were taken into custody for questioning. Frank Wiecek admitted that Tomek Zaleska had spent the night of the murder at his home, but insisted he knew nothing about the crime. Why did Tomek want to sleep at your house? Well, he was having trouble with his old man. He was afraid to go home. When did you last report to your probation officer? Last Friday. You're sure it wasn't Thursday? No, I, I know it was Friday, because that was the day my wife told me she was going to have a baby. You went to the probation officer on Thursday, not Friday. There's your report card. You're confused, son. Try to be a little more accurate. Where were you at 3.30 on December 9th? I was, I was with my wife. I remember because I was helping her shell walnuts for a cake she was making. You were wrong about the day you saw the probation officer. Maybe you're wrong about being at home shelling walnuts for your wife on December 9th. I know I made a mistake about the probation officer, but I know I'm right about the other thing. This statement was signed by your wife an hour ago. My husband was home with me on the 9th of December. I remember this because he was helping me pit dates for a cake. You sure it was walnuts? I don't know. I'm sure she must be mistaken. His wife, 
Helen was released. But because of Frank's confused testimony on insignificant points and his minor police record, he was held as a suspect. Eventually, after hiding out for six weeks, Tomek Zaleska, protesting his innocence, surrendered to the police. You know we're looking for you. You know we picked up your good friends Helen and Frank Wiecek. And why did you give yourself up? You were innocent, as you claimed. I, I was scared. Sometimes I used to hang around Wanda's place. When I heard they were picking up everybody she knew, well, I figured nobody would miss me, so I, I just beat it. I know now I made a mistake. But I came in on my own hook, didn't I? When you went to Wiechek's house that night, what reason did you give for wanting to sleep there? I didn't give any reason. I used to spend the night there once in a while. You didn't give them any reason? No. I just asked them to let me stay there, and they did. And you're sure you gave them no reason? No. After identification by an eyewitness, Frank Wiechek and Tomek Zaleska were indicted for the murder of Officer Bundy and swiftly brought to trial. I will ask you, Mrs. Skutnik, if you see in this courtroom the two men that murdered policeman John Bundy. Yes, sir. Him and him. Had you ever seen either of these men prior to the time of the shooting? Oh, sure. Tomek used to come around my place all the time. The other fellow I never saw before. And the first time you saw Frank Wiechek was on the day of the murder? Yes, sir. And the next time you saw him was the day you picked him out of the police lineup? Yes, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. People rest. Both men received a sentence of 99 years to be served in Stateville Penitentiary. This happened in November 1933. Frank and Tomek went to prison. The case was forgotten for 11 years. Forgotten until October 10, 1944, when a small advertisement appeared in the classified section of the Chicago Times. Boy! Yes, sir? Give me the file on John W. Bundy, cop killed in 32. All right. And get McNeil. Yes, sir. It's worth 5,000 bucks to someone to find out who killed a cop 11 years ago. 1932 was open season for cops. Over on the north side, they were shooting them in pairs like a brace of ducks. This is all I could find on that cop killed in 1932, that Bundy guy, Mr. Kelly. Now, you see what I mean? He didn't rate much. Well, it wouldn't hurt to check it. You might get your name in the paper. There's a sucker bait. Every grifter and mooch in town will be after that five grand. They'll frame their brothers to get it. And maybe this is a frame. There's a lot of angles, this thing. You see what I mean? It just takes you longer to catch on, that's all. I'm just thinking about it.
I'm looking for Tilly Wecheck. Uh, what you want? Well, I called Northside 777. They said I'd find her here. I'm Tilly. You run this ad? Yes. That's for me. You know something? No, no, no. No, I'm a reporter from the Chicago Times. We'd like to know why you're so interested in finding the killers of this cop. Frank Vitek is my son. I, his mother. My son's in prison for killing him. He didn't do it. My friends, they tell me if I offer big money, maybe somebody will tell who killed the policeman. Now, you mean your son's in prison for killing the cop, is that right? Yes, but he don't do it. My Frank's a good boy. He don't do this thing. Uh, about this $5,000, where'd you get it? Is that important? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's very important. Where he got it, where you got it, might have a lot to do with the case. He might have it hidden away someplace. Maybe you got it from some mob that's trying to spring him. No. No. I work. I scrub floors. Eleven years. I never miss a day's work. I earned it. Every penny. Eleven years? That's a long time. Yes. You just say it. My boy, he lived it. Believe me, mister, you don't know my Frank, but me, I, his mother... Well, you mean you got some new evidence, something that wasn't brought up at the trial? No. Uh, no. That's why I try to buy new evidence. No, no, you're just, you're just wasting your money. You'll get cheated out of it. No, not look, me. Look, look, lady, he's in for 99 years. Now, if you want to make good use of the money, send him lots of cigarettes and candy, try and keep him happy. You're very kind. But I not use my money for candy or cigarettes. If you're not able to help, I get my friend out someday. Somehow, I dream of this day. Five thousand dollars a lot for a dream. Yes. Eleven years, I dream and I work. First, I try three thousand dollars. Nothing. Now I try five thousand dollars. Suppose nothing happened. Then I work eleven more years. I get ten thousand dollars. But my boy, someday he get out. I got to hand it to you, Mrs. Wiechek. You got a lot of courage. You help me? Oh, I'm afraid I couldn't do that. I'm only a reporter. I just write the story. Now, good luck to you. This story on the scrub woman, pretty good. How'd you like to follow it up by going out to state for an interview on her son? Oh, now, wait a minute. I didn't write the story to glorify the son. He's a cop killer. Well, you got any proof he's a cop killer? Well, they didn't give him 99 years for playing hooky. He had a record. 
He was on probation when he shot the cop. Yeah, I know. I read the record, too. He's public enemy number one. He and a couple of other kids broke into a grocery store. He got two bucks and a record. But in this case, an eyewitness identified him as one of the killers. The Supreme Court reviewed the trial. The conviction was upheld. Well, so what? It wouldn't hurt anything to hear what the guy has to say, would it? Well, why? If you go out there... Well, well look, what's... Mac, let's put it this way. Maybe I'm interested for personal reasons. Maybe I'm interested because my mother did the same thing. She scrubbed floors in her hands and knees for more than 11 years. Send me through school. Okay, I'll go out to the Pandemore and see him. How about expenses? Here's a voucher. Take it to the cashier. Kelly. Hmm? I happen to know that your mother had a small annuity. She never scrubbed a floor in her life. You never got past the fifth grade. But I figure if you pull such a corny gag as this, you must want me to go pretty bad, so I'm going. But I, I want you to know that you didn't get away with it. Jim? Yeah? Too early tonight. What happened? I gotta get up at 8.30 in the morning, go out to Stateville and see that scrub woman's boy. Got something to eat for me? Mm-hmm, it's all ready. Hey. Hi. Hi. Hey, you got a new one, huh? Isn't it a beauty? Five hundred pieces. Yeah, I can't see how a smart girl like you can spend so much time on these things. Oh, I noticed you worked on the last one. Oh. You know, that was a marvelous yarn you wrote about that Polish woman. Had a lot of feeling. What a magnificent thing that old lady did. Yeah, everybody's touched. Especially Kelly. I was, too. Makes you feel warm. Well, I hit it pretty hard. But don't start believing it. I read the files on the case. That kid killed the cop. He got what was coming to him. Now, I need a branch of a tree right in there. See one around? Well, that sky. That sky. I, I wasn't thinking about the boy. I was thinking about his mother. I hammer out a sob story and everybody's blubbering all over me. You know what it is? It catches your imagination. Nobody knows whether she's right or not, but she's worked so hard, she's had such faith that... Well, I want her to be right. Honey, I love you. Well, wouldn't you scrub for it for me if I shot old Kelly in the head? Oh, I don't know. You don't. Jim. Oh, here's one. Here's one. Looks like it. Uh, Jim. Look, I'm going out to see him tomorrow. Well, you, you women are suckers for sentimentality, aren't you? I guess that's how I got you. All I had to do was dangle an orange blossom in front of you. Oh, it took a little more than that, Mr. McNeil. It did. Hmm. Mm -hmm. What kind of a guy is he, Warden? I like him. Oh. Frank, this is McNeil of the Chicago Times. He wants to interview you. 
Now, you don't have to consent to this interview or answer any questions if you don't want to. But I do want to. Sure I want to. Okay. That's fine. He's yours. Sit down, Frank. The Times has taken an interest in your case. I came out to ask you some questions. Yes, sir. I'd like more of your story, your side of it. I need an angle, something to hit the public with, you understand? Yes, sir. Now, you knew about the ad your mother ran on the papers, and the $5,000 reward. Yeah. Did you know she was scrubbing floors to earn that money? Yes, I did. All she lives for is to, to get me out. I guess that's all I've got to live for, too. Well, that's a very good angle to play out. Your faith in your mother, her faith in you. You know, if you're guilty, you're just letting her slave her life away for nothing. She knows I'm not guilty. Uh huh. I read the news clips, transcript of the trial. They don't whitewash you, the way I said. But you only read what convicted me. Well, the true facts didn't come out. Even Judge Moulton said I was innocent. The judge that gave you 99 years? Well, the jury said we were guilty. He had to. But in his chambers, he said he knew we were innocent. When was that? Well, after he sentenced us. Oh, he... after? Well, maybe we'd better duck that. What else? My lawyer was a drunk. He wouldn't even let me take the stand. He was afraid I'd get the chair. Oh, huh? go on. When they question you hour after hour, you're, you're, you're bound to get mixed up on a lot of little things the way I did. That's another good angle. Railroaded, huh? And they took me from one police station to another. Every few hours. Taking me around the horn, they call it. So my lawyer couldn't get me out. And this one, the Skutnik. The first two times she saw me, she said I wasn't the man. And all of a sudden, she said I was. Finger woman. All right, we'll play that up, too. I was home with my wife the night the policeman was killed. Does your wife visit you regularly? My wife? Yeah. We're divorced. Well, we... better duck that angle, too. You duck so many things. You don't believe me, do Listen, you? Listen, I talked to your mother. She's a very fine old woman. She believes you. I need proof. Got no proof. Yeah, yeah, I know. All right, now, what we'll do with this thing is this. We'll play up this mother angle and the finger woman, and maybe a little police and political corruption, too. I didn't say that. Well, what difference does that make? It's a good angle. Probably true, anyway. You see, you don't want a wishy-washy story. This thing's got to have sock, mass appeal. It's the only way we'll be able to help you. Get sympathy, public support. Now, you leave it to me. Okay, Ward. Thank you. That's all, Frank. Are there any guilty men out here? Not if you hear them tell it. Sure make a hard pitch, don't they? Ninety-nine years is a long time. He'd been better off if he got the chair. Mr. McNeil is busy, but I'll tell him you like the story. You're welcome. Yes, the Times is going to continue with the WeChat case. You're welcome. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, thank you very much for calling. That's right, lady. I guess the Times is going to follow up the case. Yeah. Goodbye. Say, so what are you going to use for a follow-up? What follow-up? Well, the thing is snowballing. I want more of it. Well, you want to give me a raise, or do I just get the 5000 from WeCheck's mother? Look, Mac, my job's to print the news that's fit to print. Did it ever occur to you that we might be selling this dead cop short? 
Maybe he had a mother that scrubbed floors, too. And another thing, you remember what Wechek said about that judge that promised him a new trial? Well, the judge died three weeks after the case was closed. He's been dead for 11 years. Now, Wechek's a pretty smart cookie, you know. He gives me a lead and knows I can't check up on it. Well, why don't you take a different lead? Look, Mac, you know we're getting on the average of more than 20 phone calls per hour from our readers. Yeah, and every time that phone rings, you see those great, big, juicy headlines. I know, Chicago Times clears innocent man. Well, why not? Well, why not? It's impossible, Kelly. You can't do a thing like that. Listen, Mac, if you don't like the story, if you think he's guilty, end it. Write a finish piece and kill it. I'll take that deal. I'll interview his wife. She believed in him so much, she divorced him. I ought to kill it for good. I'm looking for Helen Reiska. Yes? I'm McNeil of the Times. I'm doing a series on the WeCheck case. Oh, yes, I read them. Please come in. This way, please. Oh, excuse me. Just a minute. I got your address from your former mother-in-law, Tilly Wiechek. I haven't seen her since the divorce. I guess she doesn't feel very kindly towards me. Uh. Will you sit down, please? Do you think there's a chance that Frank will get free? Do you want him to? Sure, I want him to. Would you be waiting for him? No. No, I wouldn't. I'm married again. Oh. Uh -huh. But I'd be glad for Frank, because he's a fine man. And because he's innocent. He was at home with me when the policeman was killed. Yeah, yeah, I know. You were baking a cake. Uh, you loved him, then, I mean. I did. Very much. But the lonely nights were too much for you. You couldn't go on that way. Oh, no, it? no. Is that it? No, that's what Tilly might think. I loved him. I would have stuck to him. But Frank wanted me to get the divorce. Did he pick out your new husband for you, too? It's the truth. Did you contribute to the reward money, or did Tilly earn all that by herself? Oh, I couldn't help. I haven't anything. My husband, Mr. Reiska, takes care of me and my boy. Frank's boy. I can't ask more than that. He is a good man. And he loves me, and he loves the boy. We're lucky. Yeah, you seem to have got out of it all right. Mr. McNeil, I told you the truth about the divorce. Frank wanted it. Well, it's going to be very hard to make people believe it. Frank's wife says he's innocent and shows her faith by divorcing him, you know. But that's just the way it was. I went up to see him that day, wanting to make him keep up hope, wanting to cheer him up. He looked depressed, the way you do when you're terribly worried. How have you been? Fine. How have you been? Fine. How's Ma? Fine. And the boy? How's the boy? Oh, he is fine. Always fine. Everything's fine. We have nothing to say anymore. Oh, Frank, darling, please. Oh, I know, I know. So many things you don't say. You don't want to talk about the outside because I'm in here. You don't want to remind me. But I remind myself. I think of lots of things. Ellen, tell me, how, how's the boy doing in school? 
He's doing very well, Frank. But what about the other boys? Kids can hurt them bad. They're only kids, Frank. Yeah. They do not know what they're saying. I know. Son of a jailbird. Cop killer's son. Oh, it's nothing, Frank. I was thinking about moving to a new neighborhood anyway. He'll go to a new school. Oh, it's no good. A new school is no good, Helen. A new name. That would be good. Frank. I'm, I'm just like dead, Helen. In 30 years, maybe I can get a parole, if I'm lucky. 30 years. Helen, you... You've got to divorce me, Helen. You can't mean that, Frank. Yes. Love's not for us anymore, Helen. It's finished. Now we must think of the boy. Only the boy. My boy must live for me. But I couldn't do it, Frank. I just couldn't. And for over a year, I wouldn't do it, Mr. McNeil. But Frank kept begging me and begging me. Then I met Mr. Reiska. He loved me. And he was fond of little Frank. He understood everything about us. Well, what about the boy? Does he know? Yes. He knows. But now everyone calls his father Uncle Frank. We've made a point of that. Ma! Look, Ma, Brent! No! He lost the other one. This is Mr. McNeil of the newspaper. And that's my husband, Mr. Reischka. Reischka? And that's my boy, Frank. Hello. How are you? Say, I'd like to get a couple of shots of you and the boy, if it's all right. That's all right. Come on, son. Come over sit, here, Frank. Right there. There you are. Come on. Hey, hey. Mr. Reischka, you mind if I ask you a couple questions? Certainly not. Were you in Chicago in December 1932? Yes, why? Did you know Helen then? What do you mean, asking such a question? Any objections to answering? No, no objections. He's got to ask everything, dear, I know that. I didn't meet Helen until after she was divorced. This can be proved by our friends. I see, I see. You understand I have to ask a lot of questions. Sorry. What's he asking all the questions for, anyway? What's the big idea? Well, it's about your Uncle Frank. He's not my uncle. He's my father. Well, thank you, folks. Goodbye. Darling, wake up. What's the matter? Huh? Hungry? Want a nice sandwich? No, 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 no. You've been gnashing your teeth and making an awful noise. I've never known you to be like this, Jim. 
Well, maybe it's something I ate. I ate the same things. Well, maybe it's something I wrote. Nice. Will you marry me? I did. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Thanks. You're welcome. Just remember, I'm here. Well, come on over here. Maybe we can work this out together. What's the matter? Won't the pieces fit together? Some of them, but they make the wrong picture. Pieces never make the wrong picture. Maybe you're looking at them from the wrong angle. Sometimes it's mighty hard to figure. Why don't you let go? You want him to be innocent. You want him to be free. Admit it. Oh, maybe you're right. Maybe I do want him to be free. Now, that doesn't make me believe he's innocent. If you want to believe, that's enough. Will you marry me? Oh, that's right, you did. Yeah. Will you fix me that sandwich, then? Hey, hey, hey. Kelly, have you seen this item on the warehouse fire? Might be a fire bug, arson ring. Do you think there's anything to it? There might be. I'll follow it up. Is that an assignment? Sure. Oh, Mac, uh, I know there's nothing more to the WeCheck case. It's all washed up. But before you tackle this warehouse yarn, the warden called me this morning. WeCheck wants to see you again. Well, for what? I don't know. Maybe he wants to confess. Well, I was just up there. Don't I get time off for good behavior? WeCheck's been up there for 11 years, Mac. That cop's been buried longer than that. to tell you that I don't want you to write anymore about me or my family. I've read what you've written. I've seen the pictures of my mother, my wife, and my boy. We poured our hearts out to you, unashamed. Well, you wanted help, didn't you? That's the only way you can get people interested in the case. You, nobody's going to read a little two-line ad like your mother ran in the paper. I half a million people have been following this story. Now, somebody might know the killers and get in touch with us. I don't want that kind of help. I'll stay here a thousand years. 
But you must not write anymore about my wife and my mother and my boy. My mother is doing this for me, not to sell your papers. Oh, now, wait a minute. Richard. I made my wife divorce me, so my boy has a new name. Now you put his picture in the paper. You spoiled everything for him. I don't know. I thought I was doing a good job. No. This is writing without heart, without truth. Before I thought maybe some crook lawyer would try to get the $5,000 from my mother. But this I never figured. Yes, I say it. I'll stay here. I'll stay here a thousand years. But never write any more about my family. Leave them alone. Leave alone my wife and my boy. What do you make of that? Well, I guess he figured you pitched him some pretty low curves. It was a story. I wrote what I saw. You know, up here, every man claims to be innocent. But the prisoners are the harshest judges of themselves. And they believe we have only two men who don't belong here. Tomek Zaleska and Frank Wiecek. All right, Warden. Say, I, I wonder if you'd let me try something else. I'd like to talk to Tom Zaleska. Okay. I'd like to talk to Zaleska. McNeil of the Times. He'd like to talk to you. Yes. Warden, would it be stretching the rule too much if I talked to him alone? No. No, go right ahead. Thank you. Are you familiar with the work the Times is doing for WeCheck? Yes, sir. Now, look, Tommy, we want to clear up this Bundy case one way or the other. We don't think Frank was in it with you. Now, if you confess and name the man that was really with you that night, the Times will do everything in its power to get you a parole for turning state's evidence. The chances are you'll be out of this place in a few years. What, what have you got to lose? You're in for a life now. Come on, tell us the truth. Sure. I could say I did it. Then maybe have a chance of getting out like you say. But if I confessed, who would I name as my partner, Joe Dokes? I couldn't make it stick for one minute. That's the trouble with being innocent. You don't know what really happened. Frank had nothing to do with it. Okay, Tommy. must run a nice jail. This guy doesn't want to get out either. And I'm going to 
get this out of my system if I never write another line. Warden, do you, do you think Weechek could talk to me again? Yeah. Yeah, I imagine he would. I'll take you over to the hospital. He works there. I'd like to talk to you again, if it's all right with you. Look, Frank, I've decided to go on with this case. I'll slant the story your way. I also want you to know that I'm still not convinced you're innocent, but I'm willing to date, get the facts. But remember this, if I ever catch you lying, I'll blast you so hard you won't even get a parole when you're 33 years old. Is it a deal? I have nothing to be afraid of. It's a deal. Okay, Frank. I want you to give me some information. This, uh, this judge you told me about, you know, the one that died? Were there any witnesses when he told you he'd try and get you a new trial? Yeah, there was a bailiff. Uh -huh. What was his name? I don't know. Well, I'll find out. What was the name of your lawyer? His name was Underwood. Underwood. Where does he practice? He's disbarred now. That's great. A disbarred lawyer and a dead judge. All right, what else? There's Wanda Skutnik. It was she alone who put me where I am. She identified me, but the other two witnesses, Gruska and the mailman, said no. Then there was the police captain. He was the one who got Skutnik to say I was the man. He stood right alongside of her when she picked me out. She was afraid of him. What was his name? I never found out. He wasn't at the trial. Well, where can I find the Skutnik then? I don't know. Nice material. It's all I got, but it's the truth. Would you be willing to take a lie detector test? Mr. McNeil, for 11 years I've been waiting for a chance to get at that box. You know what you're up against? If it turns out bad, you're cooked. If it turns out good, it's only Leonard Keeler's professional opinion. It doesn't count legally. I'll take the test. Okay, I'll fix it up for you. Listen, kid, take it from me. Keep away from Keeler and that lie detector. I'm not afraid of it. That's what I said. Why, I had the cops, the state's attorney, even my own lawyer believing in me. I was a cinch. Then they talked me into going up against that box. What happened? What do you mean, what happened? I'm doing life, ain't I? machine is for is to record the emotional reactions of an individual. Uh, we place a blood pressure cuff about the upper arm of the subject and then through the impulses to the timbre system record the variations in blood pressure and pulse and the stylus. Then the pneumograph is fastened about the subject's chest and we record the changes in the respiration. And the electrodes fastened on the palm and the back of the hand to record the changes in electrical conductivity of the skin. It's a very sensitive criteria for emotional reaction, emotionality. Oh. Mr. Keeler's all ready for you, Frank. Sit down, Frank. Just take it easy and relax. I'll do the best I can, Mr. Keeler. What are you doing here? I was driving out to Decatur to see my brother and thought I'd stop by. I'd never seen a lie test before. Decatur's out the other way. 
Yeah, well, I, I took the detour, the long way around. Yeah. him to lie so it'll show on the graph. Gives a good basis for judging WeCheck's reactions. Did you choose the seven of clubs? No. Did you take the three of spades? No. Did you take the queen of hearts? No. Ace of hearts? No. You take the five of diamonds? No. Did you take the six of clubs? No. You took the five of diamonds, Frank. Did you? Yes, sir. Now I have a prepared list of questions. I'll ask you. I want you to answer all of these questions now by yes or no. And if you have anything to explain, do that after I ask you all the questions. Just turn around and face forward. Sit as quiet as you can all the way through the test. Yeah, just yes or no, all the way through. Is your name Frank Wiecek? Yes. Did you have breakfast this morning? Yes. Do you know Tomics, Alaska? Yes. Feet tall, aren't you? Uh, five foot nine. Just a minute now. Just yes or no, all the way through. I'm sorry, sir. And sit quietly. Yes. I'll have to begin again now. I'll just ask you some of these questions here. Yeah. I'm sorry. Is your name Frank Wiecek? Yes. Were you in Wanda's cut next door on December 9th? No.
Goodbye, and I'll probably see you later. See you later, Frank. What's the verdict? Well, there's the record. Well, what's, that? what's that jump there? Well, he reacted in all three curves, uh, very specifically. He lied to that question. Is that where he asked him if he killed Bundy? No. Are you married? Well, but, but he, he didn't lie. He, he isn't married. He's divorced. Yes, but he's a, he's a Catholic. And he still thinks he's married, and he feels within himself that he's married. And so he reacted in deception. But do you think he lied about anything else? Well, we run so many records today, four or five of them, and I'd like to take a little time to go over them and compare one record with another, and the reactions. And well, I'll call you later on this afternoon and let you know. Hello again. Now, early in the movie here, where we saw the scene where the cop was shot in the speakeasy, you know, we are mostly, uh, we tend to think of speakeasies during Prohibition as being these big, huge, fancy halls, you know, with, with you know, the showgirls, the big bands, the gangsters dressed in their tuxedos and, and really fancy places. That's how we often see speakeasies depicted in TV shows and movies. No. The average speakeasy in America uh, at that time was what you saw here. They tended to be little, small, hole-in-the-wall mom-and-pop cafes restaurants, you know, things like that, you know, like what you saw here. Not terribly fancy places. That really was the average speak, you know, in this era. You know, not the way we often see it depicted. <laughs> and, and it was so funny though, you know, where we saw in the picture here, you know, the newspaper headline says, cop killed in line of duty. <laughs> You saw what happened. He was stopping in there to get his own belt. <laughs> Which sounds like a good idea. Oh, yeah. Now, another little interesting piece of trivia for you here. Um, the, here toward, uh, just before the break, the guy that was administering the lie detector test, that was Leonard Keeler and he is the inventor of the lie detector. He's the one that invented the machine, and yeah, he's simply playing himself here in the picture. Now, Lee J. Cobb, uh, and he's the one playing Brian Kelly, uh, the newspaper editor. His character is based on the real life editor, Karen Walsh, and he was the one that helped the reporter, you know, McGuire, in, in, in breaking this story and getting this guy, that, you know, that guy convicted for the crime released. Um, but Lee J. Cobb, he was born in New York City, grew up in the Bronx. During World War II, he joined the U.S. Army Air Force and was initially assigned to its radio unit but was eventually transferred to the first motion pictures unit and he appeared in a lot of fundraising productions such as This is the Army and Winged Victory. And you've probably heard me mention that unit particularly uh, a lot in some of my more recent presentations, 
But yeah, it was common during World War II, uh, any guys who had any kind of acting or cinema experience, that just seemed to be the natural fit and the natural home for them. Hey, let's put them in the motion pictures unit. We can use them to make training films, fundraisers, you know, for war bonds and, you know. So yeah, so many actors got assigned to that unit. Now, in the early 50s, uh, he did become entangled in the Hollywood Red Scare thing, uh, you know, accused of being a communist. And for a while, he was blacklisted and was very difficult for him to find work. Uh, he really didn't pass muster uh, until he finally appeared before the House of Un-American Activities Committee. You know, it wasn't until he finally appeared before the committee, you know, until he was able to find work again. Now, two of his films in which he received Oscar nominations for Best Supporting Actor were On the Waterfront and The Brothers Karamazov. And amongst his TV work, he was in the regular cast of the TV series The Virginian. He had the role of Judge Henry Garth. It aired on NBC from 1962 to 1971. So let's get back to Call Northside 777. Hiya, McNeil. What can I do for you? Say, Larson, I'd like to check on the date of arrest of a fellow by the name of Frank Wiecek. You mean the cop killer? Oh, I'm just trying to do a job. I'm afraid I can't help you, McNeil. Our arrest books for 1932 are in the warehouse. They're not available. What do you want me to do, go to the commissioner? You know where you can go as far as I'm concerned. Here it is. Book for murder, December 23rd. Does that make you happy? One of the things I was looking for. He was booked on the 23rd. Now, if I could just find out whether he was arrested before then. What difference would that make? Well, if he was arrested before the 23rd, it had proved that this Skutnik dame could have seen him a couple of times before she identified him. Captain Norris of the New City Precinct handled the Skutnik identification. He never operated that way. Captain Norris, huh? Say, let me see the arrest books for December 1932, will you? I can't help you on that. Look, all I'm trying to do is to find out whether this fellow Wiecek is a cop killer or not. You know, back during Prohibition, the police department got pretty tough when a cop got killed. Now you're talking like the guy in the street. Always thinks we're running around with rubber hoses beating up innocent people. Look, you seem to think the cops framed Wiecek. You're the one that's doing the framing. You're framing the best police department in the country. Bundy was a good cop and a good man. Why don't you write about his wife and son? And about the other 357 cops killed in the last 20 years? Oh, back in 1932, they did a lot of things. Maybe they did, but they weren't always wrong. How do you know? Were you in the division at the time? No. All I can say is it's awful hard for a man like me to be fair to a cop killer. And supposing he isn't a cop killer? Maybe I ought to help you, but I just can't. You've helped me plenty, don't worry. Captain Norris, huh? Had charge of the Skutnik identification, huh? Well, it looks like he's sort of mixed up in this himself. Maybe I better go over and talk to him. You better take a shovel with you. You'll have to dig him up. He died in 38.
beat, ain't you? Yeah, yeah, sort of. I need some help. Ah, uh, lay off of me, Mac. The word's gone out to keep away from you. I've done you a lot of favors, Matt. Now, is there any place I can find some records of people that come in here and look at the police show-ups? Material witnesses. Somebody might have been subpoenaed to come in here and identify WeCheck. If we kept that kind of stuff, the books would fill soldiers' fields. Well, now, would there be any photographs? Anything we like that? We don't take no pictures in station houses. The press boys might get a shot of the witnesses on the steps, but never inside. Now, look, Mac. If I'm seen talking to you, I'm going to be back walking my old beat. Now, why not be a good guy? Don't be here when I get back. Can I use your phone? Yeah. Use that line. Don't touch those. Uh, this is McNeil. Give me Kelly. Say, check through our files to see if any of our boys took pictures of the WeCheck arrest in 1932. Get someone to check the Tribune and the rest of the papers. Now listen, Kelly. A photographer takes maybe ten shots, prints one of them. I want to see the other nine. Now listen. The Herald Examiner, they were still in business then, weren't they? And this is just their kind of picture. I'll check on that myself. Hey, uh, I just thought of something. See you later. New City Precinct. Hey, this is McNeil over at headquarters. You got the book on the WeCheck arrest, 1932? Yeah, but we've been told to pull it out of the files. I'll drop over and see it. Okay, we're out over. Right. McNeil, I just phoned you from headquarters. You got that book on the WeCheck arrest? Come in. What'd you find? WeCheck was arrested in the morning of the 22nd. He wasn't booked until the afternoon of the 23rd. Norris took his time, didn't he? What'd you say your name was? McNeil. What division? I'm McNeil of the Chicago Times. This is confidential information. This is public information and I'm entitled to use it. We've got our orders. You got a beef, you talk to the state's attorney's office. That's a good idea. I think I will. In the meantime, I wouldn't let anything happen to that book if I were you. Hard, isn't it? I haven't even started on them yet. I think this whole thing stinks. Kelly speaking. Yeah. Yes, sir. 
Right away. That's the boss. He wants us both. Let's go. Let's go. Go right in, Mr. Kelly. Mr. Palmer's waiting. Kelly, Mr. McNeil, I believe you know the commissioner. Oh, well. Mr. Faxon from the state's attorney's office. Oh, yeah. And this is Robert Winston representing the governor. How do you do, sir? Of course, you know Mr. Burns. Mr. Kelly, these gentlemen object to our handling of the WeCheck story. Mr. Kelly, we feel at the times, through you and Mr. McNeil, is slinging mud on one of the finest police departments in the United States. And specifically, we object to your efforts to arouse sympathy for a man who killed a police officer. We'd just like to point out, gentlemen, that Frank Wiechek was convicted by a jury. His case was reviewed by the Supreme Court, and the conviction was upheld. All these legal authorities believed in Frank Wiechek's guilt. Well, a long now, time ago, a lot of people believed the world was flat. Well, at this late date, do you wish to impugn the integrity of the jury and the court? If they were wrong, yes. Back in 1932, a steady stream of convictions made good publicity. Remember? Frank Wiechek was found guilty and he belongs where he is. Were you in the state's attorney's office in 1932? Why, uh, yes, I was, but I didn't have anything to do with the Wiechek case. I have no axe to grind, Mr. McNeil. But I believe you're unnecessarily discrediting this regime. Furthermore, your stories may be holding out false hope of a pardon to both Frank Wiechek and his mother. I'm not so sure it's false. We are. Look, up until now, what we've printed was based on interview and investigation. We've invented nothing, and we don't intend to. Well, a great deal of emotion and color can be lent to simple facts. The governor feels this entire matter is undermining law and order. But we check his innocent. It'd be criminal for us to stop now. Well, you must remember, Mr. McNeil, that another political party was in power at that time. We're not to blame, but the public tires us with your brush. You can't destroy the confidence we build up in this regime just to sell newspapers. Uh, it may have started like that, but it isn't that way anymore. Now, look, gentlemen, believe me, this man is not guilty. I don't know if he's guilty or not, but we don't want this police force persecuted anymore. Well, what's the difference? Oh, now, just a minute, just a minute, gentlemen. The governor wants this thing cleared up. We're not asking you to forget the man if he's innocent, but we don't want this dragged on and on just to promote circulation. Now, we have a proposition to offer you to settle this thing once and for all. I can suggest to the governor that he set up a hearing of the pardon board. If we check his exonerated, he'll get a pardon. But if you can't clear him, you're to drop this matter once and for all. Is that a deal? What do you say, Mike? It's a deal if Mr. Palmer says so. Okay. It's a deal. I'll ask the governor to set up a special hearing next week. Are you ready to accept that? Yes, I am. There's just uh, one thing, Mr. McNeil. If you go before a pardon board and they turn him down, it'll go on WeCheck's record. Then when he's eligible for parole, that record may hurt his chances. Now, mind you, there's no regulation. There's no law. But the very fact that he was investigated by the pardon board and turned down may have a prejudicial effect upon his application. What you're doing is gambling with WeCheck's parole. Now, that's a chance we'll have to take. Well, gentlemen, let's settle them. We're agreed. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We'll live up to our end of the bargain. Goodbye. Goodbye, Goodbye sir. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, you two seem to be satisfied, but Mr. Burns doesn't seem to be. I'm not. As your attorney, I think you've made a bad deal. While I have read the transcript of this case and am familiar with some of the things Mr. McNeil found, I am not at all certain that we have sufficient evidence to obtain a pardon. But you haven't seen all of the evidence yet, Mr. Burns. What, for instance? Well, in the first place, I've talked to the bailiff of the court. He corroborated Frank's statement that the judge promised him a new trial. 
Well, what basis did the judge have for making that I, promise? I don't know. If he made it. He made it, all right. Here's an affidavit from the bailiff. That's not proof. It's inconclusive. All right, all right. Forget about that. I have a lie detector test. And Keeler's sworn statement that the fellow is innocent. Inadmissible. Gruska and Decker, the other two witnesses in the crime, maintain that Wiechek is not the man. And they also testify that this Wanda Scutney couldn't possibly have recognized anybody. But have you found her? What does she say? Gruska and Decker contradict it. But it's inconclusive evidence. Now, what new admissible evidence have you? Well, there's a whole lot of new stuff. The state's attorney's office tried to keep me out of the record books. That's the reason they had that fellow faxing up here. And another thing, why is this Wanda Scutnik dame keeping undercover? A couple of mobsters might have killed that cop and threatened her for not playing ball. Or maybe she's trying to keep in good with the law. I don't know. She, she ran a speakeasy. Now, look here, McNeil. I'm an attorney. I know what it is to go up before the pardon board. They go on facts. Facts. Okay, I'll give you something better than facts. I'll give you a picture. Take a look at that. Now, Wanda Skutnik testified that she didn't see Wiechek from the time of the murder until the time she identified him on the 23rd of December. Now, Frank maintains that she did see him several times on the 22nd of December when the cops were taking him around from station to station. All right, that, that bears out Frank's story right there. There's a picture of Frank and Wanda going into one of the stations. Where'd you get this, Mac? I got it out of the files of the old Herald Examiner. Kind of figured they'd go for a picture like that. When was this taken? Well, obviously on the 22nd. Oh, now look here, McNeil. You can't just say that obviously it was taken then. You have to prove it. Well, I have the photograph. When you go before the pardon board, the burden of proof is with you. But the picture After there is all, to... it could very well have been taken after she identified him. McNeil? You've done a wonderful job in assembling all this evidence. But the law of the state of Illinois requires only one eyewitness for an identification and conviction. So far, that witness has not altered her statement, and that fact still stands. Mr. Palmer, in view of this, I'm afraid I must recommend that you permit me to get in touch with those gentlemen who were just here and ask for more time, or until I've had an opportunity to go over the case. Then your advice is to call the whole thing off. That's right. Oh, now, Mr. Palmer, I realize that Mr. Burns knows more about the law than I do. But I want to tell you some things about this case you don't know. I went into this thing believing nothing. I was skeptical. I figured Wiechek is using his mother to spring him. But I've changed my mind. This man is innocent, Mr. Palmer. I know that without any doubt. Now, it's true I haven't found Wanda Skutnik, but I want a chance to find her. I want a chance to get this guy out of jail. Now, if you call off this hearing, I'll never get that chance again. The bargain stands. Thank you, sir. Just a minute, McNeil. Let me give you one last piece of advice. Even if you do find this Wanda Skutnik, I don't believe she'll ever change her testimony. There's only one thing for you to do. Discredit her. Prove she's a liar. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. Yeah, that's great. Great speech, Mac. Now you've really got to find Wanda Scutney. Now listen, Kelly. I haven't been wasting my time. I know a lot about Wanda Scutney. Now, she used to run a speakeasy. All right, she's probably still in the liquor business. She's Polish, and she used to run around with a guy that works in the stockyards. Joe, don't let your enthusiasm get you into trouble. Back of the stockyards, a tough neighborhood. Oh, wait a minute. Don't scare me, Kelly. I'm Can you nervous. speak Polish? No, I can't speak Polish. But if I have to learn to speak Polish to find her, I'm starting right now. See that woman before? Her name's Wanda Scutnik. 
You a copper? No, 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 no. Her uncle died, left her a little money. I hear she's remarried, having a hard time finding her. Money, huh? Well, I don't know. I'll see if the boys in the back room know about it. Yeah, you Če tudi slišal se, kaj beta, če naziva Vanda Skotnik? Ni. Ja je ni vidjel. Ima pevna ženata? Ja je vsele njeno. Ima nove nazvisko? Ja znam. Nije. Daj mi drugo kartu. Odpaj, če je ravno. Če je zakon. Zdaj še. McNeil divided the district back of the yards into blocks and sections, and for days and nights systematically combed every beer parlor and saloon. <laughs> See that woman around here? No, I don't think I have. Her name's Scutnik, Wanda Scutnik. A lot of women come in here, but I don't know them by name. this neighborhood. I've been reading your stories in the paper. About Wanda Scutnik? Yeah. You know her? Used to. Used to be good friends. Do you know where I could find her now? I might. Where? What's in it for me? What do you want? I owe him a buck seventy-five. Okay. Where is she? I ought to have one to talk on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, a couple of drinks here, huh? What happens to Wanda if you find her? Oh, not a thing. I'm just going to ask her some questions. There ain't no warrant out after her. No, nothing no. like that. No, no, nothing like that. Leave the bottle here, too, will you? She hadn't ought to have thrown them bricks at me. You know Honora Street? Yeah, yeah, sure. You go down there. 725. 725. What's her name now? 
Siskovich. Wanda Siskovich. But don't tell her I said so. She's got a bad temper. I don't want her throwing no more bricks at me. Won't tell her a word. There you are. Thanks. Come in. Who are you? I'm from the time. Get out of here. So you're Wanda Scutnik. Yeah. I've been wondering when you'd show up. Now, look, lady, I, I'm not going to give you any trouble. I'd just like to ask you a few questions. You want to cry in my beer? All I want to know is this. Is there any possibility that you might have been mistaken when you identified WeCheck? No. Well, if you're so positive, we can prove it. Will you take a lie test? A lie test? You think I'm crazy? Look, will you give me a sworn statement? I did my swearing in court. How many times did you see Frank before you identified him? Never. You didn't see him before the police show up? No, only when he killed the cop. Look, I said all I got to say. That's all there is, see? What do you mean, that's all there is? There's a lot more than that. This kid's been up in the pen for 11 years. Now, look. I've got to go before the pardon board, day after tomorrow. Now, Frank's got a good chance to get off if you help. I got no reason to help we check, and I got no reason to help you neither. You're the one that wrote them lies about me. I've been thinking of suing you for libel. That's the reason I wrote them. I called you a liar and a bootlegger and a finger woman. I insulted you every way I could think of, and I'm going to keep on doing it, see? Go ahead and sue us for libel. I'd just like to get you up on a witness stand on her own. Yeah, That's and all. you still wouldn't get nothing out of me. <laughs> you bother put that down you want to go to jail now you get out of here now listen maybe there's something you didn't think of there's a five thousand dollar reward you know five thousand dollars and what's more you don't have to do anything about it just tell me enough to clear things up get we check out and you get the five thousand so what do I got to do? Just tell the truth. Who got you to identify him? Who are you afraid of? Nobody. Nothing. Nobody. I ain't afraid of nobody and ain't got nothing to say. Wonder. It's $5,000. 
Shut up! Now you get out of here. You ain't gonna get nowhere. I identified him. I told the truth. It's him. I ain't never gonna change my mind. It's him. Now get out of here. Burris! <laughs> Mr. Burns has given us a clear picture of the situation. If Wanda Scutnik can defy the pardon board, if the board has no authority to subpoena her, the power to make her talk, then we're helpless. What do we do now? The thing for us to do now is for me to appear before the pardon board at Springfield this afternoon, present our apologies, and ask that the case be withdrawn. Will that appear on Frank's record? Will it spoil his chances when he becomes eligible for a parole? No, his name simply will not come before the board. All right. That's it, then. I'm sorry, Mr. Palmer. I want to apologize to you, too, Mr. Burns. I thought if I found this woman, I could make her talk, but I missed her. I'm sorry. Okay, Mac. Kelly, write a finished story on this Wanda Skutnik and end the whole thing. Get the paper off the hook. Well, I can get a train for Springfield in about half hour. Good. Big day for the wee checks. Write a finished story. Get the paper off the hook. How'd he end it? Well, first you better go out and see wee check's mother. I couldn't do that, Allie. I just couldn't do that, Kelly. What he wanted to do, read it in the paper? myself. Uh, I was not expecting company. Well, you mustn't regard me as company, Kelly. I, I was baking a pie for Frank. Uh, please sit down. I'll get you some coffee. I, I really can't stay, Telly. I, I just came out to talk to you about something. About the pardon board, yes? Oh, I pray for this day. Yes, I, I want to tell you about it. Yeah. Come over and sit oh. down. And now, now it has come. It is here. Telly, I must tell you this. Yeah. We're going to call off the hearings. We don't have a chance in the world of getting Frank his pardon. No chance? No. But you work so hard. You do everything. Everything I could. You got lawyers. He tell pardon board. We have the best. But don't you see, Tilly, if we go before the pardon board now, it'll just be hurting Frank's chances for a parole later on. 
we can't get a thing out of Wanda Skutnik, and without her, we have nothing. I saw her at the trial. She will never tell. Like a rock. She will never tell. But she knows. Yes, she's afraid. She will not talk, never. And without her, we have no evidence. Evidence? They got no evidence when they sent my Frank to prison for 99 years. I got no evidence when I scrub floors every night. Go without supper. Walk to work so I save a nickel for Frank. Evidence. What is this evidence? I can't tell you how sorry I am, Tilly. You tried to help. You're a good man. But if this thing happened, then we fight some more. We fight more and more. Yes? No, Tilly. We're calling off the hearing. The Times is dropping the case. No. But if you go, I got no friend left. I'm sorry. <laughs> no friends left. No friends, no more. Sure, I got a friend. Too. Now the Chicago Times. Well, the fellow's writing those stories, ain't you? Seen the paper? Change that, will you? Get me down to police headquarters. Fast you can. Right away. McNeil of the Chicago Times. First door on your left, Mr. McNeil. Say, uh, did you make the enlargement of the photograph of this forged check here? Yes, why? I got a picture here. I just wondered, could you blow that section of the picture up right there? Sure. It, it, would all the details come out on it? Well, that depends. You got the negative? No, that's all I got right there. Well, then I'd have to make a dupe. 
How long would that take? Oh, a couple of hours. What do you think? Could, could you get started on it right away? Yes. But you're McNeil at the Times, aren't you? Been working on that WeCheck case. That's right. I'm McNeil. At first, I thought this guy was guilty. But now I don't know. You take a look at it. Hey, can I use your phone? Sure, right over there. I want to put in a person-to-person -person call to Mr. Martin J. Burns. He's up at the state capitol in Springfield, Illinois. That's right. Sorry, gentlemen. The pardon board is in special session. The case of Frank Wiecek. Gentlemen, I feel somewhat at a loss because I came here to ask that the petition of Frank Wiecek be withdrawn. However, about an hour ago, I received a telephone call from James McNeil of the Chicago Times who informs me that uh, he has uncovered the evidence we've been seeking. It is conclusive evidence that supports the petition of Frank Wiecek. You may present the evidence, Mr. Burns. Unfortunately, gentlemen, my telephone conversation with Mr. McNeil was necessarily brief. He is flying down to Springfield. He should be here at any moment. What evidence does he have? I'm afraid I don't know. Mr. Chair, Mr. Faxon, I object. The state's attorney's office has the right to demand orthodox conduct of this hearing. If you have conclusive evidence, present it. Otherwise, we ask that the petition be denied here and now. Mr. Faxon, we certainly intend to follow orthodox procedure in this Board of Pardons. Have you got anything at all? Don't have a thing. We just have to stall them. Let me talk to them. All right. Mr. Chairman, gentlemen, I'd like to ask your permission to have Mr. McNeil of the Chicago Times address the board. Granted. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, gentlemen, I'd like to apologize for being late, but it was just impossible for me to get here sooner. I, uh... I don't know how much Mr. Burns has told you. Strictly from a reporter's point of view, understand. I've assembled what I feel is a very solid case. And of what does this case consist? Well, it consists of such debatable items as a lie detector test. Now, I realize that you're unable to accept that. You want evidence. But sometimes the weight of evidence, just because it's in the record, is heavy enough to crush the truth. We'll discuss the shortcomings of our judicial system some other time, Mr. McNeil. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I, I realize that at the present time you want facts. We have a notarized affidavit from the bailiff of Judge Moulton's court that the judge felt that Wecheck did not receive a fair trial. We have those documents before us, Mr. McNeil. They could hardly be called conclusive. Yes, sir. But as you probably know from those documents, Gruska and Decker contradicted Wanda Skutnik's testimony, and those affidavits bear them out. The board is aware of that too, Mr. McNeil. But Wanda Skutnik has not altered her testimony, has she? Wanda Skutnik lied from beginning to end. She lied about everything. You know, it's a very funny thing about the Statue of Justice up there. She has a sword in her hand. It's a double-edged sword. Cuts both ways. It keeps cutting the ground out from under everything in favor of Frank Wiecek, but the other side of it, that, that isn't so sharp. It doesn't cut the ground out from under Wanda Skutnik, and she's the only one responsible for Wiecek's conviction. Now, I have a police record here. 
that proves that Wiecek was arrested on the 22nd of December. I have another one here that proves he wasn't booked until the 23rd of December, one day later. Okay. Wanda Skutnik testified that she didn't see him from the time of the murder until the time she identified him on the police lineup. Here's a photograph of Frank Wiecek and Wanda Skutnik together going into a police station. Now take a look at that, gentlemen. That's new, and that's the basis of my conclusive evidence. The two photostats of the police records merely indicate that some time elapsed between Wiecek's arrest and the time he was booked. As a reporter, you know very well that this is a common occurrence at police stations. Yes, sir, but what about that photograph? It must be perfectly obvious to you, Mr. McNeil, that we have no way of knowing when this picture was taken. Was it on the 22nd or the 23rd? Or was it during or after the trial? Yes, sir, I know. Now, gentlemen, that's what delayed me. Now, if I do prove that that photograph was taken on the 22nd of December, one day before Wanda Skutnik identified Frank Wiecek in the police lineup. How about that? What then? In that event, Mr. McNeil, we might be obliged to render a favorable decision. But can you prove it? Yes, sir, I think I can. I just need a little time. Time? Do you mean to say, Mr. McNeil, that you still have no corroborating evidence? No, I'm not sure. The police laboratory down in Chicago is enlarging this section of the photograph. Now, if the enlarging process... Yes, is I know, but how long will this take? As soon as the enlargement is developed, they're going to send it over the wire photo system from the Chicago Times to the Illinois State Journal, which is just a few blocks down here. Now, all I ask, gentlemen, is that you go down there and see that thing with me. I object. The methods of publicity previously used in behalf of the plaintiff indicate that this may rightly be regarded as an attempt to make journalistic capital of this hearing. Now, I am authorized by the state's attorney's office to state categorically that in the opinion of our office, the facts set forth in WeCheck's behalf do not indicate that he was a victim of a miscarriage of justice. We're here to protect the interests of the people of this state, not to sell newspapers. Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen. The governor ordered this hearing for the purpose of arriving at the truth. If you fail to consider every item of evidence, no matter how improperly presented, you have defeated the very purpose of this hearing. What is your decision, Mr. Chairman? Gentlemen, we'll go. Are you clear to Springfield? Yes, sir. The wire's open. Well, hold it open. I'll have the picture in a minute. Which one's McNeil? Yeah, right here. There are a couple of prints that came in a while ago from Kelly of the Chicago Times. This one's blown up a hundred times. This one, 140. He said you'd understand. Okay. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Ask them if they're ready. Springfield, are you ready for this picture? We're ready. Okay, here's the final lineup. Okay. All ready, Mr. McNeil. Gentlemen, let me explain to you what's happening here. As you remember, this is the picture I showed you before. You know, and this is the area we're working on right here, the newsboy. All right, now this print is that area enlarged a hundred times. And this print is that same area enlarged 140 times. Now the picture coming in now is this area right in here, blown up as big as possible. Well, what do you expect to find in the enlargement? The date on the newspaper held on the newsboy's hand. Is that possible? Uh, frankly, I don't know, sir. It depends on a whole lot of things. The condition of the dupe negative, the density of the print. The... I've been doing a little praying, too.
That's it, Mr. McNeil. Excuse me, please. How long will this take? Oh, it's a positive print. Shouldn't take long. You can come along with me if you want. This way, Colonel. Remember, this is the area I showed you. There, it's beginning to come through. Now, watch the date. Watch the date. December, there it is, December 22nd, 22nd of December, there it is. Goodbye, boy. Good luck, Frank. Thank you. New suit and 10 bucks. Almost a dollar a year. Oh, look, Frank. It's a big thing when a sovereign state admits an error. Remember this. There aren't many governments in the world that would do it. Yeah, I know. I want to thank you for everything you've done for Helen and the boy. And I want you to know you can have the boy with you whenever you want him. And for as long as you like. Thanks. It's a good world outside. Yes, it's a good world outside. And Frank Wiecek is free. Free because of a mother's faith the courage of a newspaper, and one reporter's refusal to accept defeat. Welcome back. Boy, I'll tell you, you know, listening to all that Polish polka music there, did... Did you feel like you were watching the Lawrence Welk show? <laughs> and, you know, what, you know, as, as he's going through all of those bars, you know, they're in the Polish district of Chicago. And we saw a lot of, like, store signs and advertisements, you know, for Schlitz beer. You know, whatever happened to Schlitz beer? You know, in this era, Schlitz was as big as... Budweiser or Miller or Coors today. You know, whatever happened to him? It was sometime, it, it was in the early 70s, they decided in order to cut costs on production, they changed the recipe, you know, something there in the brewing process. And what it did is it gave the beer a different taste. And I mean in a bad way. And it tended to expire and go sour more quickly. A lot of consumer complaints about it, and uh, there was even a point where uh, Schlitz even had to recall it, you know, bringing it back from their distributors. I mean, it was a huge debacle. And ever since that happened, you know, Schlitz 
never became what it was again. I mean, I think you could, you know, the company was even sold through a number of other different labels, you know, like to Anheuser-Busch and then to Pabst and, you know, I think you can still find a can of beer that says Schlitz on it, but it is a ghost of its former glory. Now, also here, you know, toward the end of the picture, we saw that scene, you know, where, where they were sending uh, the photo from one news office to another, and they called it the wire photo system. What that was, was it was an early form of fax machine. Uh, yeah, so the technology goes back that far, but, but it was so complex and cost prohibitive, they only tended to be used by very large corporations or even institutional settings. You know, they wouldn't, you know, perfect the process of getting it down, you know, to smaller businesses or consumer grade until the 1980s. Now, Jimmy Stewart, <laughs> Gotta get to Jimmy Stewart here, okay? Yeah, he's the one playing McNeil, the, the reporter. Uh, he was born in Indiana, Pennsylvania. Yes, in the state of Pennsylvania, there is a town named Indiana. That's where he was born and grew up. And his career was from 1936 to 1980. But he did make a return in 1991 to provide the voice for the character Wiley Burp. It, it was 1991's animated film, An American Tale, Fievel Goes West. Uh, but yeah, that was his last instance of having anything to do with film. Now, he became a leading man in the late 1930s, early 1940s, uh, films such as You Can't Take It With You, Vivacious Lady, and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Now, he did win an Oscar for Best Actor for 1940s uh, The Philadelphia Story, but other films in which he was nominated for the same award were Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, the holiday classic, It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> I mean, who can think of Jimmy Stewart without thinking of that movie? But uh, yeah, that one. He was also nominated for Harvey and also Anatomy of a Murder. Now, he also appeared in four Alfred Hitchcock films. He was in Rope, Rear Window, The Man Who Knew Too Much, and Vertigo. And some of his other notable films, films like The Greatest Show on Earth, The Spirit of St. Louis, Bell Book and Candle, and that he was in with Kim Novak, and that movie was the inspiration for the later TV series Bewitched. And also a number of westerns which included how the West was won, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, and Cheyenne Autumn. I mean, he is certainly uh, an American film icon. Now, if you like old pictures like this, remember, click on the subscribe button so you're notified of future releases in the notification bell. And you can just click on the Full Moon Matinee icon down here and you can find all of the prior releases. And, as always, I thank you for spending the evening with Full Moon Matinee. Stay with us as we continue our further investigations into the long-lost evidence of Hollywood. Until next time.